Thank you very much to the organisers. This is a totally awesome meeting. Um, it's so much fun and good to see people I haven't seen in decades. And uh, thank you for inviting me here. I am going to tell you the story of my first trip to Antarctica, but uh, first a little bit of background. I grew up in Wellington, New Zealand, that's the accent, and um, <laughs> I sort of partly gone. And uh, I did a double major in zoology and geology, and at the time when I wanted to go on to, at Victoria University in Wellington, at the time I wanted to go on to uh, do graduate work, I was uh, way better at biological sciences, not so much in the geology, but uh, I wanted to go into fisheries and I heard that uh, they wouldn't let women on the boat, so I decided I wanted to go to Antarctica instead. So, <laughs> the courses are ridiculous. <laughs> so, Victoria University has a long history of geological work. We used to hear about it as students and talk to people and see slides when we came back. Uh, the first expedition, in fact, was Peter Webb and Barry McKelvey in the Dry Valleys in 1957 uh, during uh, IGY events. Uh, Peter Barrett and Barry Kahn at the beginning in January 1970 were putting together an expedition to South Victoria Land and the Darwin Mountains. Uh, Peter Barrett had just finished his PhD at Ohio State here. Uh, working on Permian-Triassic rocks in the uh, Beardmore Glacier area. And Paul Guy, he had just arrived from the US as a postdoc in Wellington, and I walked into his office and announced that I wanted to go to Antarctica. <laughs> so anyway, uh, they did the usual application process there, and three students were chosen. The only problem is one of them was a woman, that was me. And at that time, of course, as you heard from Kelly, the US Navy was not about to let some 21-year-old girl into the field with a whole bunch of guys by herself, for God's sake. So <laughs> anyway, uh, it was thanks to the persistence of Peter Barrett, and in particular, Professor Bob Clark, who was the head of our department. He spent many hours on the phone to DC, and uh, at that time, that was a major deal. There's, toll calls by the minute. We didn't even call our grandparents in New Zealand. <laughs> <Anyway>. <laughs> so uh, we, we got together a party of eight people. And oh, I forgot the main story of how I got to go. So Professor Clark was um, talked to all the folks in Navy and it, probably NSF, and he didn't ever tell me the content of those conversations. But the final hurdle was that the Navy doctor was not allowed or else was uncomfortable treating a woman, should I get hurt, without a woman present, another woman present. So Bob Clark got over this, it's bizarre, but it was agreed that should the need arise, the leader of Scott Base, who was um, Brian Porter, would stand in as my dad. And so I just... <laughs> So this was our team. We had um, Peter Barrett. There was um, three three people. Peter Barrett, as I said, he just uh, he's there on a postdoc. Barry Kahn and Rodney Grapes were both in their final stages of their PhDs as three students, and we were each working with one of the other people as their assistant. So I was to assist Peter Barrett working on the Permian Triassic rocks, and I also had my own project working on the fossil pollen and spores. John McPherson was going to work with Barry Conn on the Devonian Taylor Group rocks. Rodney and David were igneous petrologists. They were going to work on the ferrite, dolerite, and related rocks. And then um, in previous expeditions, some early ones, and also Guai 13, Barry Conn was on that one, and uh, along also with Peter Webb and Barry McKelvey, funnily enough, they found some more uh, really good uh, locations with fossil fish. So Alex Ritchie, very Scottish, but he worked in um, Sydney. He was coming down to work with, with us on the Devonian fossil fish, and Gavin Young came as his assistant, and he ended up also doing a PhD down there. So here's our crew in the ice caves, just next to Scott Base. Uh, let's see if I can... There's Peter Webb. Oh, sorry, Peter Barrett in the blue, uh, Barry Kahn over here. God, I'm shaking like a leaf. Rodney Grapes, <laughs> John McPherson, Gavin Young, and um, Dave Reed. 
So uh, we got to Scott Base, and um, oh, it's easier working this way. Scott Base in those days in 1970, uh, spent most of the time packing up our gear, sorting. We did a trip up to Cape Royds and Cape Evans to try out our equipment. Uh, that was McMurdo back in those days. We spent some time, you know, there's the usual waiting for our good weather and our plane trip out. We spent time visiting McMurdo. We, we got a tour of the nuclear power plant that was still running then, or was still there at least. Uh, then, of course, you've heard about the Huskies still being there. We got to play with the dogs. And finally got to load up out in Willie's Field. So here we are loading up, ready to head off. So this is a map from another project, but it shows where we were, oh. this is sensitive, yeah. So we were um, put in in the Skelton Neve, and this is probably easier to work here, yeah. Skelton Neve, which is this area tucked in behind the Royal Society Mountains. Uh, we worked um, in Mount Portal, you'll see these places here, that's Mount Portal. These are mountains from other trips, but we worked our way up past Bas Bastion to Robeson and Dearborn, and then down to the Darwin Mountains. So here we are with the hurt taking off, leaving the eight of us on the Skelton Neve. Uh, this was from a later expedition. We had nice bright yellow new tents, but it was to remind me to talk about food. I could not find my photos of the notorious food boxes, but that big brown carton you see there on the right is a Scott Base 10 day two man food box. So we had um, dry, just to let you know what we lived on in those days, egg powder, and after about a month of that, there was no way I could place it ever again in my life. <laughs> <laughs> Fleming, Fleming's milk, OTs, various, you know, huge amounts of sugar and butter and Cadbury's chocolate, that part was good. Uh, for dinner we had de high and this is not your mountain house, these were old fashioned uh, little packs that we used to soak all day before we went out of um, beef mince, beef stew and, and beef curry and we had potato, dried potato and uh, vegetables. Uh, they used to go right through and change perfectly. <laughs> <laughs> we did, and um, we did supplement that with some fruit cake, all the vast supplies of sledge biscuits too, sort of half that. And um, we had a few can, canned goods. Things got better in later expeditions. <laughs> <laughs> Clothing. So we got out, and, and it's funny because you'll see from the slides we look like a ragtag bunch next to um, the US, nice red jackets and everything. <laughs> We wore it back there, of course it was wool, and it's interesting to see after going through all the various um, substances, they've gone back to wool again, which is nice. So we had long wool and un long johns, um, fairly scratchy old fashioned type. I have, of course, had to get this from all sort of farmers, men's stores, and they were always too big for me. Woolen pants, thick woolen shirt, woolen sweater, um, all that we provided, the university of course had their own supplies of anoraks, um, ice axes, geological equipment, all that type of thing. And then um, Scott Base and New Zealand program provided the heavy down clothing, the sledges, toboggans, ropes, all that fun stuff. So here we are on the skeleton, there's um, portal all the way off in the distance to the left and feather on the right. Uh, we spent about a day or so getting our cash ready. It was to be our base camp. And um, here we are, the, the crew about to proceed off to Mount Mitchell. That's the portal ice falls and the plateau in the background. So just mentioning these toboggans, which you'll see a little bit of. These are Polaris motor toboggans, which in their prime were amazing machines. They could tow anything, work on any surfaces, uh, I believe they were used by Canadian farmers a lot. Uh, we got them sort of way, way, way many years past their best buy date. 
some of the mats and sleds too. So you'll see as we proceed along, this turned out to be not very good. We, we didn't have enough spare parts, and, and in truth, we probably had all the spare parts that were left at Scott Base. This was the end of their lives, and um, I think we, we ended up in the recommendations I was reading later after the, after the trip. I think we had fewer spare parts for one machine, for four machines than we should have had for one machine. So here we started off and on our way to Mitchell, uh, putting this slide up again to say that um, the surface, the Sestrugi, the ice car bridges were a lot worse than we had expected. Some of them were up to about three foot high. Uh, we had tip overs. We took um, a very circuitous route to get it's three or four miles to Mount Mitchell and it took us all day that first trip. The slide was labeled the first breakdown. <laughs> <laughs> This very familiar scene. So we have bolts um, breaking. Oh, well, I'll go over that later. But anyway, suffice it to say, it took all day to travel three or four miles, but we made it. We did, this is Mount Mitchell, which became a, a very, you know, highly recognizable and um, beloved landmark. It's a nun attack there in the south, southwest corner of the Skelton Neve. Uh, we did several days' work there and uh, took off for our next trip, which of course also took us out all day. <laughs> and we had the, the um, bolts shear off the bottom, the, uh, the drive train would come off. Yeah, it's, it was bad. <laughs> and these two pictures <laughs> tell it all. <laughs> That's Barry Kahn. <laughs> And at least you can say the weather was good at that moment. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. So we eventually made it to our first destination. This is the Warren Massif. David and Barry and um, uh, let me see, Rodney. We're going to work on the dolerite here. This huge layered dolerite, and we were working on the other outcrops just across the way. And you can see I see our camp out there. Oh. Again. Yeah, out there in the middle. Let's see if I can get this pointer. Yeah. And this is at Alligator Ridge, very aptly named. And we had nice views from some of those outcrops of the Warren Massif across the way. Huge, I think this is the Deception Glacier that you see running across with these huge wind scoops around next to the outcrops. Now, Barry and I. Uh, John, we're going to work on the Devonian rocks. This is the uppermost Devonian. Uh, I'm going to throw in a bit of geology here. I can't help it. And that's what we were there for. So <laughs> anyway, the uppermost Devonian unit is the Aztec siltstone. Uh, beautiful, beautiful red beds, variegated red, purple, and green soils, uh, freshwater deposits. This is what John ended up doing his PhD on. So this is what he was working on. And then the sandstone ledges are mostly what the fish fossils are found in. So this is Alex. He's got a, um, the, you can see the bone down here that he's looking at. These were incredible. So the, the um, fish fossil on the left, actually, then it was the, or the oldest uh, paleoniscid fish, raffined fish. And you can see the girls there to the, to the left tail and the ventral fins there. But a lot of the fish were these bony armoured things. This is the head shield of Bothriolepis. You can see this is up the other way, but this is the top of its head. These two eye, uh, this is where the eyes were in this bend shape. This is where it joins the rest of the body. So these fish at these t this time, living in freshwater ponds and rivers, were um, had this bony armour on them. So this was a rather different and, and new Fish. Working down in the bottom of the wind scoop on those rocks. So this turned out to be a fairly windy place and a lot of lot of a uh, lot of days because of the delays we had with the toboggan breakdowns and how long it took everywhere to get everywhere. We spent quite a lot of time working in less than ideal circumstances. Uh, one nice thing about that season was then. The radio schedules to Scott Base were only Tuesday, Thursdays, and Sundays, which gave us a lot of freedom about the time of day we wanted to work, whether you know whether you had the sun on the outcrop or not. 
uh, and longer days. Now, it also meant we did a couple of 24-hour days at that time too, just getting things done. Get up in the middle of the night and shovel more snow on the tent so it won't blow away. And uh, some of the days were incredibly windy. Gavin Young got blown off the outcrop. Fortunately, he didn't fall too far and wasn't hurt, but Barry Conn did fall a long way. He was caught in a really bad gust. He had to be um, taken back to New Zealand. He did return later on this, in the season. Uh, one funny story about that, there was an unnamed peak that he fell off. And we wanted to call it Mount Condescending. <laughs> <laughs> and the geographic board wasn't having that. <laughs> so, yeah. so anyway, we, we battled back and dribs and drabs and shuttled and uh, back, back to the base camp. Things got worse. You can see there the wooden runner is broken there. The uh, gas tank is the back of the seat. Those bolts sheared off, so they were held on by ropes a lot of the time. The throttle cables, we did have some replacements, but they kept breaking. So often one of us would ride on the runner with our finger through the glove on the throttle over, over I keep pointing at the screen, over here. One to, uh, we also rigged the rope. Um, <laughs> that, was, that was the throttle. Uh, just to show you here, because it, it, it's part of a story from later on, this is the, the, the throttle lever that, that we use. It got worse. <laughs> and so we had, for that case, we had to get a helicopter to shuttle the various bits and pieces of toboggan back to our base camp and they were later loaded on the herc and take, taken back to see if they could fix them or at least retrieve some parts. So at this point, this was a herc resupply. John, uh, Rodney and Dave and a, a Scott-based field assistant went up to Allen Hills. But because there were no toboggans left that we could all share, they manhauled around that area, which wasn't too bad for much of it. They did have a couple of arduous days in there. So, Peter and, and um, Alex and uh, Gavin and me, we stayed here. This is the um, hurt leaving. And we moved up to Portal Mountain, up here, moved our camp. This is after a blizzard. And just point out the portal. This is a big snow slope, and this is the plateau up here. So this is the portal. This is Feather, Mount Feather over here. So we moved camp over there and started working. This is the base of Portal. Peter and I started off. What we were doing through all this area was mapping the, all the rocks and also measuring very detailed sections up through the, um, all the different uh, units. So these are the fish beds down at the bottom. The fish guys worked on that and we continued on. We celebrated Christmas Day here. I think one of the most exciting things we had was a can of um, little potatoes. <laughs> and uh, just to point out what Peter and I were working on, we were working on the Permian Triassic fluvial sediments and coal measures. You can see a nice coal bed there. And I was actually collecting the, uh, besides the pollen and spores, collecting fossil plants. These are Permian Glossopteris leaves. And, and on the left, this is a silicified tree trunk of Permian age. And in the Triassic, these are the fern-like leaves of Dicridium. And so this, the, the, the matrix of these rocks and other fine-grained rocks, this is the um, grey mudstone and siltstone I was collecting uh, to extract pollen and spores from. So uh, there was a slight problem in the Transantarctic Mountains is the dolerite, which of course, you know, is, is not what David Elliott likes to hear because <laughs> those are some of his favorite rocks. But anyway, this just to show the non-geologists, this is a dolerite sill. This is Tabula Mountain, I believe, running up through the sediments. So dolerite for the non-geologists, well, I've got to hurry, is the um, intrusive equivalent of basalt. So it's intruded, extremely um, hot, and it cooks the organic matter. 
So these are pollen and spores, they're at different scales. There's a very nicely preserved Narcophagus or Southern Beach pollen from the Cape Roberts project. This one shows the cooking very nicely. It's the same, same species of spore from the Cretaceous <laughs> of the South Shetlands. Well, these are organic walled fossils and it's just like cooking hamburger where it goes from pink meat to brown to darker brown to burnt to a crisp. And in fact, because of all the dolerite, most of my samples were burnt to a crisp. And this is a slightly better preserved dicridium pollen. And this I had to show you because after palynology processing is a very nasty, very long process. I spent many weeks, months, years processing these. And this was the first spore I found in a water mount from Horseshoe Mountain, actually. So anyway, this is the upper part of Portal Mountain. Peter and I actually spent 19 hours on the rock finishing this up because the first day we tried it, was, the wind was too bad. We almost got blown off the outcrop. So that's me at the top of Portal Mountain. You can see Mount Mitchell out here. Uh, this is the edge of the Warren Massif, and these are all the peaks we worked on earlier in the season. We traveled up, ferried the sleds up one at a time up the portal, and that's further to the right and headed up to the Lashley Mountains for some reconnaissance work and work down the fish fossils there. Spent a few days there. We went back at a subsequent season. It's crevasse fields off the south end of um, the Lashleys. And I had to show this map. Sorry, it's turned up the other way from the previous. This is from the infamous Green Book. We published all our measured sections. So this shows our base camp. We went down here through this area. This is Mount Mitchell, Portal, up to the Crean. And then we were picked up. Uh, we got a, uh, requested a hurt transfer up to Horseshoe Mountain. That was not our original plan. And worked in a horseshoe up through this area, Robeson and Dearborn. Uh, this area turned out to be very snowy. We ended up with our outcrop covered in snow. We were wishing for wind to blow the snow away. A lot of whiteouts. And this one I show because Scott Bay sent out two brand new fancy motor toboggans. They were little lightweight, two-stroke Japanese machines built for speed, totally useless on blue ice, and totally useless for pulling anything on blue ice. <laughs> but at least it got us around for day trips. So we went back to Scott Base, a hot shower and a few days of working on the machines and headed down to the Darwin Mountains. This is actually the Haverton Glacier, the Darwin Mountains. It's looking towards the um, Ross Ice Shelf there. This is the map blown up. We were put in here at Island Arena, traveled around, uh, and we eventually picked up, this was not the plan either, but motor toboggans, <laughs> we were picked up from over here, camped over here in the Darwin Mountains. And this brings me to my woman driver story. Uh, the, we had uh, the vice chancellor of our university he was a VIP at Scott Base, and he was coming out to the field to see his field team offloaded from the Herc and put into the field. Well, unbeknownst to me, Scott Bass had done a lot of tinkering with one of the new snow tricks and had put in a new motor, a four-stroke motor in the snow trick. And so I'm standing in all the fumes and noise on the snow trick, taking it down off the ramp off the hurt. I get down to where we're parking it, yank back on the throttle, uh, which I, in the other ones, that's the brake. And it took off, flat <laughs> tack, <laughs> threw me down on my back. <laughs> And uh, I nearly cried. I think Peter Barrett probably did cry at this point. <laughs> anyway, after the Herc left, we followed the tracks down there and it was still running, turned on its side. You can see there the... <laughs> so we had to do a victory dance. And this is, see there, the treads are not that great for blue ice. Uh, our Scott Base Field Assistant, Seamus Corrine, very Irish. He brought the luck of the Irish with him there, you see on his shoulder. <laughs> Beautiful sections. This is Devonian sandstone. We did a lot of climbing in this area. The, the early Permian green glacial beds up there on Coliseum Ridge. This is a good memory of mine next to this little dolerite dike up there. I sat down uh, writing in my notebook. I was so exhausted I fell sound asleep and my pencil just went down the page. <laughs> Uh, we had a bit of trouble traveling there. This is our sled tipped over in a crevasse, so we had to unload carefully and reload. 
That's our camp next to the Haverton Glacier looking over. There's a lot of dolerite in that area. And the next shot is taken from the other side looking back. And you can see our tents there and the tracks running down. It was spectacular country. We spent two weeks there. Peter and I would take off for the day. I, he'd be driving usually and I was sitting looking back the other way, clinging on for dear life and watching the little crevasses as we went over them go Ch -ch, and then the big ones would go and then we <laughs> So anyway, we, we did um, quite a bit of work using those. <coughs> Mugging up the hill, a lot of dolerite. We climbed a lot of dolerite sills that down there to get up to the top of the mountain. Eventually picked up his Peter on the left, Gavin in the middle, Seamus on the right, leaving uh, the, the Darwins. And just with a blizzard screen uh, shot, I just, you know, can't end without thanking all the many, many, many people that I have worked with, the geologists, support crew, all the folks that I've worked with. I don't have many group shots, but in the last 10 seconds, I have, just to show this is Vuai 16, some of the people in that. Vuai 18, and we had another woman there, Janet Andrews here at that time, very commodious restroom up the back. <laughs> This was my first trip with the US um, party. This was on um, Seymour Island in 1982. And uh, this is P OSU folks here is um, Bill Zinsmeister, Carlos Masala, I'm uh, sorry, Brian Huber, Carlos Masalari, for those of you who know them. This was a, a small part of the group in the Shackleton Glacier in 1596. Uh, uh, Molly Miller, who I've done a lot of work with, and John Isbell. Gina, who, um, John's student, um, gosh, I can't think of her name, um, field assistant anyway. Uh, also from Ohio State, Jim Collinson, and not shown in this photo, there was uh, Anne Grunau, uh, David Elliott, Peter Webb, various, it was quite a big trip. And the final slide, this was one of my favorite um, projects. This was with the Cape Roberts drilling project. This was Cape Roberts II in the Crary Lab in 1998. Uh, John Symes is not in that photo. He did the processing. Ian Rain, Vanessa Bowman, Mike Hanna, and John Wren. And that's it. <laughs>